Okay, so Noam Chomsky's Reflections on 9 11. Not since the War of 1812. Hold on, there's an editor's note. An editor's note, what's, what follows is a set of interviews conducted with Noam Chomsky by a variety of interviewers during the first month following the attacks of September 11th, uh, 2001 on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. The interviews were conducted largely via email, many with foreign journalists who speak and write English as a second language. Although some interviews were conducted as early as eight days after the attacks, edits, editions, and revisions consistent with the latest news continued up until the book left for the printer on October 15th. As a result, interviews dated September may contain references to October events. Furthermore, in the process of editing, sections were cut out with questions. However, da, 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 da. as Chomsky wrote me during the editing process, these facts have been completely removed from history. Once one has to practically scream them from the rooftops. This expanded edition of 9-11 contains Reflections on 9-11, an essay that Chomsky wrote for a Swedish publication in August 2002, looking back almost one year after the attacks. Not since the War of 1812, based on an interview with Il Manifesto in Italy, September 19, 2001. Question. The fall of the Berlin Wall didn't claim any victims, but it profoundly changed the geopolitical scene. Do you think that the attacks of 9-11 could have a similar effect? The fall of the Berlin Wall was an event of great importance and did change the geopolitical scene, but not in the ways usually assumed in my opinion. I've tried to explain my reasons elsewhere and won't go into it now. The horrifying atrocities of September 11th are something quite new in world affairs, not in their scale and character, but in the target. For the United States, this is the first time since the War of 1812 that the national territory has been under attack or even threatened. Many commentators have brought up a Pearl Harbor analogy, but that's misleading. On December 7, 1941, military bases in two U.S. colonies were attacked, but not the national territory, which was never threatened. The U.S. preferred to call Hawaii a territory, but it was in effect a colony, like Puerto Rico is today or Guam. During the past several hundred years, the U.S. annihilated the indigenous population. Millions of people conquered half of Mexico, in fact, the territory of indigenous peoples, but that is another matter, and intervened violently in the surrounding region, conquered Hawaii and the Philippines, killing hundreds of thousands of Filipinos, and in the past half century, particularly extended its resort to force throughout much of the world. The number of victims is colossal. For the first time, the guns have been directed the other way. And that's a dramatic change. The same is true even more dramatically of Europe. Europe has suffered murderous destruction, but from internal wars. Meanwhile, European powers conquered much of the world with extreme brutality. With the rarest of exceptions, they were not under attack by their foreign victims. England was not attacked by India, nor Belgium by the Congo, nor Italy by Ethiopia, nor France by Algeria, also not regarded by France as a colony. It is not surprising, therefore, that e Europe should be utterly shocked by the terrorist crimes of, sep of September 11th. Again, not because of the scale, regrettably. And exactly what this portends, no one can guess, but it is something strikingly new. Something strikingly new is quite clear. My impression is that these attacks won't offer us new political scenery, but they rather confirm the existence of a problem inside the empire. The problem concerns political authority and power. What do you think? The likely perpetrators, the likely perpetrators, the likely per perpetrators, the likely perpetrators were are a category of their own, but uncontroversially they draw support from a reservoir of bitterness and anger over U.S. policies in the region, extending those of earlier European masters. There certainly is an issue of political authority and power. In the wake of the attacks, the Wall Street Journal surveyed opinions of moneyed Muslims in the region, uh, bankers, professionals, businessmen with ties to the United States. They expressed dismay and anger about U.S. support for harsh authoritarian states and the barriers that Washington places against independent development and political democracy by its policies of propping up oppressive regimes. Their primary concern, however, was different. Washington's policies towards 
Iraq and towards Israel's military occupation. Among the great mass of poor and suffering people, similar sentiments are much more bitter, and they are also hardly pleased to see the wealth of the region flow to the west and the small Western-oriented elites and corrupt and brutal rulers backed by Western power. So there definitely are problems of authority and power. The immediately announced U.S. reaction was to deal with these problems by intensifying them. That, of course, uh, that is, of course, not inevitable. A good deal depends on the outcome of such considerations. Is America having trouble governing the process of globalization? And I don't mean just in terms of national security or intelligence systems. The U.S. doesn't govern the corporate globalization project, though it is, of course, uh, though it of course has a primary role. The programs. These programs have been arousing enormous opposition, primarily in the South, where mass protests could often be suppressed or ignored. In the past few years, the protests reached the rich countries as well, and hence became the focus of great concern to the powerful, who now feel themselves on the defensive, not without reason. There are very substantial reasons for the worldwide opposition to the particular form of investor rights globalization that is being imposed, but this is not the place to go into that. Intelligent bombs in Iraq, humanitarian intervention in Kosovo. The U.S. never used the word war to describe that. Now they're talking about war against a nameless in, uh, enemy. Why? At first, the U.S. used the word crusade, but it was quickly pointed out that if they hoped to enlist their allies in the Islamic world, it would be a serious mistake for obvious reasons. The rhetoric therefore shifted to war. The Gulf War of 1991 was called a war. The bombing of Serbia was called a humanitarian intervention, by no means a novel usage. This was a standard description of European imperialist ventures in the 19th century. To cite some more recent examples, the major recent scholarly work on humanitarian intervention cites three examples of humanitarian intervention in the immediate pre-World War II period. Japan's in invasion of Manchuria, Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, and Hitler's takeover of the Sudetenland, which is the Czech Republic. The author of Course, or uh, the Bohemia, the Bohemian Forest, Kingdom of Bohemia is the Sudetenland. The author, of course, is not suggesting that the term is apt, rather that the crimes were masked as humanitarian. Whether the Kosovo intervention indeed was humanitarian, possibly the first such case in history, is a matter of fact. Passionate declaration does not suffice, if only because virtually every use of force is justified in these terms. It is quite extraordinarily how weak the arguments are to justify the claim of humanitarian intent in the Kosovo case. More accurately, they scarcely exist, and the official government reasons are quite different. Um... The proper term would be crime, perhaps crime against humanity, as Robert Fisk has stressed, but there are laws for punishing crimes. Identify the perpetrators and hold them accountable, the course that is widely recommended in the Middle East by the Vatican and many others. But that requires solid evidence, and it opens doors to dangerous questions, to mention only the most obvious one. Who were the perpetrators of the crime of international terrorism condemned by the World Court 15 years ago? For such reasons, it's better to use a vague term like war to call it a war against terrorism, however, is simply more propaganda, unless the war really does target terrorism. But that is plainly not contemplated because Western powers could never abide by their own official definitions of the term, as in the U.S. Code or Army Manuals. To do so would at once reveal that the U.S. is a leading terrorist state, as are its clients. The terrorism, as defined by the U.S. Code, is this. An act of terrorism means any activity that A involves a violent act or an act dangerous to human life that is a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or any state, or that would be a criminal violation if committed within the jurisdiction of the United States or of any state, and B appears to be intended I to intimidate or coerce a civilian population, I, I to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, or I, I, I to affect the conduct of a government by assassination or kidnapping. This is the United States Code, Congressional and Administrative News, 98th Congress, Second Session, 1984. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about 9-11. Um, it turns out an attack against Afghanistan will probably kill a great minute, many innocent civilians, probably enormous numbers in a country where millions are already on the verge of death from starvation. Wanton killing of innocent civilians is terrorism, not a war against terrorism.
some of his reflections on 9-11 a year afterwards were written at the back of this book, which wasn't uh, uh, present when it came out, but it was in 2002. So, it is widely argued that the September 11th terrorist attacks have changed the world dramatically, that nothing will be the same as the world enters into an age of terror. The title of a collection of academic essays by Yale University scholars and others which regards the anthrax at attack as even more ominous. There's no doubt that 9-11 atrocities were an event of historical importance, not regrettably because of their scale, but because of the choice of innocent victims. It had been recognized for some time that with new technology, the industrial powers would probably lose their virtual monopoly of violence, retaining only an enormous preponderance. No one could have anticipated the specific way in which the expectations were fulfilled, but they were. For the first time in modern history, Europe and its offshoots were subjected on home soil to the kind of atrocity that they routinely have carried out elsewhere. Uh, the history should be too familiar to review, and though the West may choose to disregard it, the victims do not. The sharp break in the traditional pattern surely qualifies 9-11 as a historical event, and the repercussions are sure to be significant. Several crucial questions arose at once. One, who's responsible? Two, what are the reasons? Three, what is the proper reaction? And four, what are the longer-term consequences? As for one, it's assumed, plausibly, that the guilty party were bin Laden and his al-Qaeda network. No one knows more about them than the CIA, which, together with its counterparts among U.S. allies, recruited radical Islamists from many countries and organized them into a military and terrorist force not to help Afghanistan's resist Russian aggression, which would have been a legitimate objective, but for reasons, for normal reasons of state, with grim consequences for Afghans after the Mujahideen took control. U.S. intelligence has surely been following the other exploits of these networks closely ever since they assassinated President Sadat of Egypt 20 years ago, and more intensively since the attempt to blow up the World Trade Center and many other targets in highly ambitious terrorist operation in 1993. Nevertheless, despite what must be the most intensive international intelligence investigation in history, evidence about the perpetrators of 9-11 have been hard to find. Eight months after the bombing, FBI Director Robert Mueller testifying to Congress could say only that the U.S. intelligence now believes that the plot was hatched in Afghanistan, though planned and implemented elsewhere. And long after the sources of the anthrax attacks was localized to U.S. government and weapons laboratories, it was still not been is still not been identified. These are indications of how hard it may be to counter acts of terror against the rich and powerful in the future. Nevertheless, despite the thin evidence, the initial conclusion about 9/11 is presumably correct. Turning to two, what are the reasons? Scholarship is virtually unanimous in taking the terrorists at their word, which matches their deeds for the past 20 years. Their goal in their terms is to drive the infidels from Muslim lands to overthrow the corrupt governments they impose and sustain and to institute an extreme, extremist version of Islam. More significantly, at least for those who hope to reduce the likelihood of further crimes of a similar nature are the background conditions from which the terrorist organizations arose and that, that provide a mass reservoir of sympathetic understanding for at least parts of their message, even among those who despise and fear them. In George Bush's plaintive words, why do they hate us? The question is not new and answers are not hard to find. Forty-five years ago, President Eisenhower and his staff discussed what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, not by the governments but by the people. The basic reason the National Security Council advised is a recognition that the U.S. supports corrupt and brutal Governments that block democracy and development and does so because of its concern to protect its interest in Near East oil. The Wall Street Journal found much of the same when it investigated attitudes of wealthy, westernized Muslims after 9-11, feelings now exacerbated by specific U.S. policies with regard to Israel, Palestine, and Iraq. General, uh, commentators generally prefer a more comforting answer. Their anger is rooted in resentment of our freedom and love of democracy, their cultural feelings tracing back many centuries, their inability to take part in the form of globalization in which they happily participate, and other such deficiencies. More comforting, perhaps, but not wise. Um, a couple more things here on 9-11 that I want to read, but with 20 seconds I'm not going to rush. So, more with Noam Chomsky.
9-11, Noam Chomsky, and then we'll get to the Occupy after um, I feel like 9-11 and understand power gives a baseline